Good morning. As a Nova Scotian myself, I know that the likes of Hurricane Fiona have never been seen before in this province. And now, in Nova Scotia's time of need, I am heartened to see our Canadian Armed Forces rising to this challenge. Today, I will be traveling to Picto County to see our Canadian Armed Forces personnel and the work that they are doing in one of the hardest hit areas of the province. Bien que du progrès a été réalisé pour réétablir les routes et l'électricité, les membres des forces armées canadiennes restent actifs sur le terrain dans de nombreuses communautés touchées en Nouvelle-Écosse et dans les provinces de l'Atlantique afin de fournir du soutien essentiel. Many armed forces members are working in their own communities, assisting friends and neighbors in need. I have heard countless stories of their efforts across the Atlantic provinces, and today I will thank some of them in person. For example, when farmers in Spring Valley PEI struggled to reach their crops, members of Task Force Prince Edward Island helped to break up debris and cleared their path. As of last night, there are now over 700 military personnel across the three Atlantic provinces that have submitted requests for assistance to the federal government. I will now provide an update on their efforts in Nova Scotia, PEI, and Newfoundland and Labrador. Nova Scotia. En Nouvelle-Écosse, des membres des forces armées canadiennes continuent d'enlever les débris des routes, des ponts et des lignes électriques dans les régions durement touchées, comme le Cap Breton. As an example, in the last 24 hours, our Canadian Armed Forces helped Nova Scotia Power with constructing a staging area at Mayflower Mall in Sydney, and they have been assisting with general duties at the staging area since then. This work will continue today. Damage assessments are being conducted in Sydney, Picto, and New Glasgow to determine effective supports moving forward. Joint Task Force Atlantic, bolstered by members of 36 Canadian Brigade Group Domestic Response Company, established a headquarters in Truro, which has now moved to Picto, to coordinate the disaster response. This response centre is the central hub for all relief operations in the province and on Prince Edward Island. A number of naval vessels and ships also remain ready to assist. This includes HMCS Fredericton, which is on standby in Halifax. The Canadian Armed Forces will continue to provide vital assistance to Nova Scotian communities as they rebuild and recover. Moving now to Prince Edward Island. On PEI, military members from the 5th Canadian Division 4 Engineer Support Regiment, supported by primary reserve members, are continuing to deliver a coordinated response with the Provincial Department of Transportation and Infrastructure. Des membres des Forces Armées Canadiennes aident également à dégager et à ouvrir les routes pour uh, permettre aux, aux, aux ressources d'aide et se rendre dans les collectivités qui ont été isolées. Ce travail est effectué en collaboration avec le ministère des Transports et de l'Infrastructure de l'île du Prince-Édouard. Moving to Newfoundland and Labrador. In Newfoundland and Labrador, there are approximately 200 Canadian Armed Forces members, including members from the 5th Canadian Division and 37 Canadian Brigade Group Domestic Response Company, HMCS Margaret Brook, and the Canadian Rangers, supporting relief efforts in the province. Furthermore, HMCS Margaret Brooks' crew traveled alongside the south shore of the province, conducted substantive damage assessments, and engaged with the affected coastal communities. The crew spoke directly with residents in Francois, Grey River, and Ramya, Borgio as well, and they will soon speak with residents of La Poix. Les avions de l'Aviation Royale Canadienne 
Elle est navire de la marine royale canadienne reste également prête à apporter leur aide. Our Canadian Armed Forces also continue to be hard at work checking on their neighbours. In Porto Basque, for example, the Canadian Rangers connected 950 check-ins with residents to see how people are doing. They have also been helping residents access their homes. In conclusion, to everyone in Nova Scotia and in all affected areas, the Canadian Armed Forces will continue standing shoulder to shoulder with federal, provincial, municipal and community partners to provide relief. We will continue to deliver a coordinated, comprehensive response and we thank Canadian Armed Forces members who are at the very centre of this critical work. Merci aux membres des Forces Armées Canadiennes qui font du travail essentiel. Thank you. Merci. Megwetch, over to you, Sean. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Minister Anand. It's uh, it's great to have you back home here in in Nova Scotia. Uh, I'm uh, thrilled to have the opportunity to uh, join you today as we visit my part of the province, uh, Pictou County, uh, to meet some of the folks on the ground who are helping uh, in what continues to be an extraordinarily challenging situation. Uh, just to put this into perspective for folks who might not be on the ground, uh, there's a lot of people who are in need of uh, some pretty serious assistance. Uh, there is key infrastructure uh, roadways that uh, appear to be irreparably damaged uh, and have some temporary solutions for now. Uh, there's going to be key economic infrastructure uh, that's going to need to be replaced, uh, in particular in the fishery. Uh, there's going to need to be help uh, for people who've lost crops in farming uh, and ordinary uh, businesses on, on main streets that haven't yet. Uh, gotten their power back or having trouble uh, keeping the doors open and and the workers who depend on a paycheck from those businesses in many instances have not actually been able to return. Um, some of the things that I'm hearing at home right now is the people who might even have uh, insurance coverage uh, have no estimate uh, of the timeline that it's going to take to actually get a contractor to come and do some of the work. Uh, and of course, uh, many people are, are left wondering whether they will have coverage for some of the damage that's been inflicted on their homes, either because they didn't have insurance or, or suffered uh, uninsurable losses. Uh, of course, we're working very closely with uh, provincial governments to advance uh, support through the disaster financial assistance arrangements uh, to support those who continue to be in need. Uh, despite the uh, extraordinary damage uh, that is impacting our neighborhoods, every second street uh, seems to have extraordinary damage. Uh, what sticks out for me is, is communities coming together as it has over the last uh, number of days. Uh, we see people showing up with chainsaws uh, to cut down uh, trees that have fallen on people's homes. Uh, we've had uh, a food bank set up at St. Evex University where more than 100 students were displaced uh, just so students could help one another. In Cape Breton, I uh, heard stories the other day of a group of international students who uh, built a fire and started preparing food in the streets to support people in the community who didn't have uh, the ability to, to feed themselves. Uh, this is the very best of, of Nova Scotia uh, that we're, uh, we're seeing. Uh, we're going to continue to do everything we can uh, to get people connected. I've learned just moments ago that, in fact, uh, my own home, which uh, had power restored for about a day, uh, has since lost it, and we are expecting several more days without electricity. Um, it's going to be continue to be challenging uh, in the days and weeks ahead. Uh, this recovery will no doubt uh, take months before things start to look and feel normal again. Uh, but to see the power of community coming together to support their neighbours in a time of need uh, makes me extremely proud to call this part of Nova Scotia home. I'll hand it over to uh, Joyce to uh, to share a few words. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. As Minister responsible for fisheries, oceans and the Canadian Coast Guard, I've been hugely concerned about the impacts of uh, Hurricane Fiona and so heartened to see communities band together in its aftermath, as uh, Minister Fraser was just describing. When it comes to fish harvesters and critical infrastructure like small craft harbours, we will be there for Atlantic Canada and Eastern Quebec. I know the scope of loss for harvesters has been immense, and I've heard from some who've lost more than half their gear. More than 180 of the 706 small craft harbours that DFO manages across Atlantic Canada were in the path of the storm. My department is working with local harbour authorities to quickly assess the damage to each harbour as we chart a path to rebuilding them. 
les équipes, on peut commencer à nettoyer certains ports où l'accès était possible et où le matériel était disponible. Here's the latest update. We know 99 are partly operational, five are not operational, and 20 will need further assessment. Nous nous attendons à ce que le nombre de ports hors de service augmente au fur et à mesure des inspections. Également, il est possible que nous découvrions que plus de ports ont été touchés que cette première estimation, mais nous allons rebâtir. Climate change means extreme weather events like this will become more frequent and severe. So harbors will need to be rebuilt to withstand those conditions. Hurricane Fiona has changed the reality of this year's fishing season for many. On Tuesday, I met with fisheries ministers from Atlantic Canada, and I'm in contact with fish harvesters from across the region, and I am ready to work with them on any requests for season extensions. More than 500 staff from the Canadian Coast Guard and DFO are involved in efforts to respond to Fiona's damage, and many of those have been affected by Fiona themselves. Safety first service, service always is the, the Coast Guard's motto, and it is fully operational. Crews are helping repair damaged navigational beacons. They are responding to sunken or grounded vessels. They're working with owners to safely remove them. So far, we've removed 23 such boats. And I do want to thank people for doing everything they could to get their gear and boats out of the water before the storm. It made a difference. The Coast Guard College in Sydney, Nova Scotia has a warming center for area residents and it's housing 60 displaced people. And thanks to the 150 young cadets who are helping with shelter and cleanup efforts. Now, if you are a fish harvester and have not checked on your boat yet, please be careful and only go when it's safe and know that the, the Coast Guard's emergency hotline is operational for any maritime hazards that you see out on the waters. We want to hear from you. I know this has been such a stressful week for so many, and we will continue to keep you updated. I'd like to thank Canadian Coast Guard members and DFO staff for all of their hard work for the communities. Please stay safe. And now I will turn it over to my colleague, Francis Thouin, Parliamentary Secretary. I will turn it to Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Agriculture. Merci, Minister Murray. The high winds from Fiona also caused severe damage to farm infrastructure, livestock, and crops right across Atlantic Canada. Et bien sûr, cela inclut aussi l'Est du Québec. Over the past few days, I've been in touch with various people on the ground. And I do want to take the opportunity to thank Mary Robinson, Ron Minard, John Visser, Gordon Macbeth, Tim Marsh, and local MPs who are on the ground and providing that feedback in terms of farm damages. I've heard some heartbreaking stories. And others have reached out to Minister Bebo's office, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, as well as the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. We've seen an incredible community spirit spirit right across Atlantic Canada. And I think Minister Fraser is absolutely right. Our farmers are showing heroic courage and resilience in the face of adversity. Farmers don't have the choice to take care of their livestock. They have to take care of it right away, even if their own homes are destroyed. And neighbors helping neighbors is a theme that I have heard over and over again. The storm came at the worst possible time, right in the middle of harvest. Prince Edward Island was particularly hard hit with the crops such as apples and corns destroyed just before harvest. Storage facilities flattened and livestock trapped in collapsed barns. In Nova Scotia, there are reports of losses to crops and infrastructure, including apples, grapes, maple operations, field crops, and greenhouses. And more reports are coming in from right across the region. Nous travaillons en étroite collaboration avec les provinces et le secteur agricole afin de déterminer la meilleure façon d'aider nos agriculteurs à se remettre sur pied le plus rapidement possible. Department officials have been in constant contact with provincial officials, and they'll be meeting again today at noon. CFIA is doing all it can to maintain the critical services that farmers need, including inspections for commodities bound for export. 
There are a number of federal, provincial, territorial programs available to help producers facing significant financial losses from this storm. And that includes agri-stability, which helps producers who have suffered large drops in income. We are ready to work with the province to help producers get the maximum benefit from agri-stability. And that includes delivering up to 75% of agri-stability payment to producers upfront and extending the application deadline so affected producers can access the funds. And there's help available through the agri-recovery framework. The framework allows federal, provincial, territorial governments to work together and deliver fast relief to producers impacted by natural disasters like this one. The funds help producers with extra costs of recovering their operations and to fill the gaps not covered by existing programs. We stand ready to work with our Atlantic partners to launch an assessment under agri-recovery as soon as possible. And we will continue to work shoulder to shoulder with farmers across Atlantic Canada, Acerj Quebec, who have suffered damages from this devastating storm and help them get back on the road to recovery as soon as possible. And I'll now turn it over to my colleague, the Honorable Goody Hutchings, Minister of Rural Economic Development. Thank you, Francis, and good morning, colleagues. Good morning, friends. Yesterday, in the middle of all this pain and hurt on the southwest coast of Newfoundland, the Prime Minister came to visit, and it was truly incredible to see him on the ground because he can then experience what we've been reporting to you each and every day, how you can't have a full appreciation for the damage here until you see it. He was able to speak with people and families that have lost their homes. Um, he was able to reach out and, and thank the many, many volunteers, including the CAF and the ground and the range and the local hockey team who would come, the lo local grade six hockey team who would come to help in the line center to unload the trucks and trucks of donations that are coming. Um, by him seeing this firsthand, he was able to sit down with the mayor and the town manager and the councils and really understand the damage and how we, the federal government, will be there along with the province to help these communities build back. We're still in recovery mode here, friends. There's heavy equipment everywhere cleaning up the debris. It's going to be a while yet before the towns can fully assess the damage to their infrastructure. So there's the immediate, the short term, the midterm, and the long term. And as my friend Minister Fraser said, the long term is going to be a while. I want to remind everybody they have to register with the Canadian Red Cross. It's 1 800 863 6582 or www.redcross.ca forward slash Hurricane Fiona. Especially if you're in the small eight line communities where you don't have a town council or you don't, it's hard for you to drop in, please go online and register. That is the site so that the province and the municipality knows the damages that you've had, whether you've lost fishing gear, whether you've lost your home, whether you've lost part of your home, whether you've lost, you're just in need of, of new food and, and, and shelter. Um, in Port of Basque, there is an emergency command center set up now. It's set up by the province, but I know DND is, is a vital component of that as well. They have a local number as well, helping, helping people in the area on the ground. The donations that are coming in are just heartwarming. Uh, the Red Cross, as of last night, was at $10 million. So with us matching, that's over $20 million. But I want to assure people, that's not all the federal government is doing. As all my colleagues have said, we'll be there working hand in hand with the provinces as we build back. This is going to be a very costly adventure, and we need to build back safer, stronger, and better for our fishermen, for our farmers, for our communities, and most importantly, for our residents. So stay safe, everyone. I'm in a little community called Burgio now on the southwest coast of the island, another area hit. And later, um, I'll be planning to go over to Ramia, another island in the area that was, that was hard hit. So being on the ground and speaking with people and seeing how we plan to build back from this, but also plan for the future. So stay safe, my friends. And I think now we're open for questions. Alors, on va passer effectivement aux questions. Si vous en avez une, s'il vous plaît, levez votre main. On va commencer avec Libertium de Canadian Press. Lee, veux-tu poser ta question? Oh, yeah, sorry. I pushed the unmute button. Um, yes, thank you. Um, I, I beg your indulgence. I've 
indulgence, I'd like to ask uh, Minister Ananda a question different from Fiona. Uh, the Canadian Armed Forces continues to have vaccine requirement as a condition for employment, even after such requirements for all other federal public servants, including Defence Department civilian employees, and now international travellers have been lifted. Do you think it is time to suspend the military's requirement as a condition for employment? And what explanation has the CDS given for maintaining the current requirement? Yeah, I'd like to thank you for your question, Lee. Uh, members of the Canadian Armed Forces have a duty to maintain their operational readiness and preserve their ability to serve Canadians at home and support our allies and partners abroad. That is front and center on General Ayer's mind uh, as he uh, considers this issue. And this is in fact why Canadian, um, the Canadian Armed Forces are still um, uh, required to have at least two shots of vaccines. This is why COVID-19 vaccination has been mandatory for Canadian Armed Forces members. And in fact, uh, over 97% of Canadian Armed Forces members uh, chose to follow public health advice and to get vaccinated. Uh, we have to remember that vaccination requirements for the Canadian Armed Forces have been in place with regards to various vaccines for decades. Now, given the updated guidance from Treasury Board, the directives on COVID-19 vaccination are currently under review in order to maintain a safe working environment and order to in, and in order to ensure that the Canadian Armed Forces can continue uh, to be operational, to conduct CAF operations. Uh, in the meantime, Pending this review, the CDS directives remain in effect for CAF members until further, further notice. Thank you. And as a follow-up, you mentioned the uh, the two the requirement remains and has remained for uh, almost a year now. Uh, two shots, uh, which uh, it seems like would be out of date and would almost suggest that the requirement is is either unnecessary or or doesn't make any sense now. Um, you also mentioned the uh, the review that the CDS has been doing, but it's been months since we've heard any update. Uh, this review has been promised for months. What is what is the slowdown? Uh, why is it taking so long to conduct this review? Is it because of potential law lawsuits or anything like that? And uh, why is the requirement even still there if it, it continues to be only for two shots? Uh, Lee, the vaccine requirement for military is a CAF leadership decision, which is made by the Chief of Defence Staff based on the advice of the Canadian Armed Forces Surgeon General. And I know from speaking with General Air numerous times on a number of issues that protecting members of the Canadian Armed Forces and the defence team and ensuring their operational readiness is of the utmost importance. It's a force that must be ready at all times to conduct domestic and international military operations, uh, sometimes in places with limited or no access to specialized medical care, uh, sometimes in very close quarters with their fellow Canadian Armed Forces members. Uh, Therefore, the Canadian Armed Forces has a more stringent requirement to enforce health protection measures to protect the operational readiness of personnel. Those are the issues that are central to General Air as he's considering this issue. And uh, as I said, it is under review at the current time and CDS directives remain in place until further notice. Thank you. Annie Bergeron Oliver, CTV. Hi, thank you very much. Um, Minister Anand, you mentioned today that there are now 700 military members in the three Atlantic provinces. That's up from 100, I believe, on Monday. I'm wondering if you can tell us why more military members were not sent at the beginning of this uh, hurricane disaster cleanup. Why weren't 700 sent on Sunday or Monday instead of a gradual increase? Annie, thanks for the question. We had been planning for CAF support uh, to each of the hard hit provinces well before Hurricane Fiona hit. And what we 
made sure to do was to have Canadian Armed Forces members on hand to fill the tasks that were being requested of us. In particular, Nova Scotia asked us for more people, and so we provided more people. Uh, they and the other provinces are identifying tasks, and we are providing Canadian Armed Forces members to fill those tasks on an ongoing basis. We are matching personnel with the tasks that they are needed for as those tasks become identified through the week. And therefore, what we saw at the beginning was a hundred or so CAF members in each of the three provinces. We knew uh, that we may have additional asks, and so we had troops at the ready. They were very uh, easily deployed, and that's why we're able to say now today that we have well over 700 here um, and uh, will continue to stand at the ready should more assistance be required. Thank you. Thank you very much. And my second question is also for you. Uh, the Kremlin announced plans to annex four Russian-controlled regions of Ukraine in a vote that the U.S. is calling a sham. Does Canada recognize this vote, and does the escalation by Russia change the posture of Canadian troops in any way? I agree wholeheartedly that the referendums were a sham, and that the annexation is completely unjustified and contrary to the international rules-based order. Canada condemns these actions, and I personally am disgusted by them as they are reprehensible and a completely unwarranted and illegal intrusion into territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine. And Canada will continue to stand shoulder to shoulder with Ukraine and our NATO allies in upholding the rules-based international order and the sovereignty of states on which that order has been based since the end of the Second World War. Ukraine's territory will always remain Ukraine's territory. We will move to David de Cochrane, CBC. Hello, ministers. Um, my, my first question would be for Minister Murray. Uh, you, you mentioned that you'd heard from some fish harvesters who have lost more than half of their gear. And, and in many cases, if that gear was lost because of storm surge, it, it simply wouldn't be insured. Um, so I, I'm wondering, uh, I, I, and I'm sure people appreciate the assurances of federal support, but what specifics can you give us on the level of compensation? Uh, these fishermen and fish harvesters can expect for their gear. I mean, would the federal government backstop a 100% gear replacement program um, so that people who've just been hammered uh, aren't hammered financially further? Well, thanks for that question. And of course, we know that the gear, um, as are the uh, the small craft harbors, is absolutely critical for next uh, fishing season. And uh, so we're still assessing, we're still having conversations with the provinces, the, and the fish um, fishing organizations, so that we can figure out how to best support the recovery. I think you've heard that from most of the ministers that this is a period of assessing and supporting where we can and decisions will come after we have some clarity as to the scale of the losses and where they are. Thanks, uh, and my, my, oh, sorry, go ahead, Mr. Fraser. Uh, yeah, David, just uh, if I can supplement uh, uh, Minister Murray's uh, response. Uh, one of the things that I think it's really important for Canadians to understand is that we've developed over the years a, uh, a strategy to deal with uh, severe uh, losses that are uh, unexpected, perhaps, uh, through the disaster financial uh, assistance arrangements. Uh, the formula that we use depends heavily on uh, programs that are established by provincial governments, but they can establish those programs with the knowledge that the formula to backstop uh, some of these uninsurable losses uh, will be there to the federal government. Um, at the upper end of the scale, the federal government can cover up to 90% of the, the losses that the province builds into its programming. Uh, now, before you get to 90%, uh, there, there's a smaller proportion 
uh, up to uh, different levels on a per capita basis for each province. Uh, so we do have a ready-made mechanism to extend supports, uh, but to the point that Minister Murray, I think, articulated very well, uh, we do have to understand the scale of the losses, but we are working to advance uh, interim payments so provinces know that there won't be a, a cash flow issue. We've done this with British Columbia in the past, uh, where we actually forwarded uh, in excess of a billion dollars in, in a similar emergency response. These are things we're working through very carefully on a day-to-day -day basis with the province as we speak, uh, but I'm grateful that we had a pre-existing me mechanism. So Nova Scotians and Atlantic Canadians and, and Quebecers uh, aren't necessarily going to be waiting for programs to roll out. They, the provinces know that we're going to be there through this mechanism. No, and I appreciate that clarity, but I know Minister LeBlanc has said a couple of times earlier this week that those programs are a little bit dated. They were built for a different time and different types of disasters and need upgrading. So I was curious as to what level of upgrading might be on this. But uh, as a follow-up question, I, I think it again, the Minister Murray and maybe Minister Anand, is as I know we've seen the devastation station on land and in the communities, but a significant amount of debris has been pulled into the sea and it's in fishing lanes and shipping lanes. The Port of Basque, as you well know, is, is the main anchor point uh, on the island of Newfoundland for the Marine Atlantic ferries. So who cleans up the mess in the ocean? Has there been a request for assistance for either the Navy or the Coast Guard or whoever to help with that? I mean, what what's the process? That well, thanks for that. And firstly, uh, the Canadian Coast Guard members are ready to help with any request for assistance for, for cleaning up gear at any time. Um, we, as I mentioned in my remarks, we have over 500 uh, people in the Coast Guard and we and uh, many people in the um, DFO offices that are also helping communities. It, it, it will be very important to clean this gear up out of the water because as we know, uh, it keeps fishing when it's a uh, uh, ghost gear, when it's not being attended. And we also know that it poses a risk to North Atlantic uh, right whales potentially. And so cleaning the gear out of the water is important for fish harvesters. And it's also important for the environment. If, if I could just clarify beyond the gear, I mean, there's houses, there's parts of houses, there may be cars, you know, like you know, the sort of disaster trash. I'm wondering what happens with that, who takes care of that? David, if I can jump in, it's uh, Minister Hutchings here. I can tell you, I met with the Premier yesterday when he was here and they've expanded their RFA um, to include ocean waste cleanup because exactly right there is how there's garbage, there's sheds, there's fishing gear, there's everything floating at sea. So the province extend, expanded their RFA today to include ocean waste cleanup. There's also been an advisory issued by transport, of course, to be mindful when you're when you're navigating in these waters to be prepared for anything floating around at sea. And I'll just uh, follow up here. I too have been in very close touch with Premier Fury every single day, in fact. And uh, we discussed this very issue, David, and the need that the province has for additional cleanup. And we'll continue to work closely with Newfoundland and respond to any requests that it has. Uh, we're all uh, take this situation very seriously, as you say, parts of houses in waterways. <laughs> this is a very serious situation on land and at sea, and the Canadian Armed Forces will continue to be there for all provinces, including Newfoundland and Labrador. S'il y a d'autres questions, n'hésitez pas à lever euh, votre main. Moi, j'en aurais peut-être une, Louis Blouin, ici, de, de Radio-Canada, pour la ministre Anand. J'aimerais vous entendre euh, en français sur euh, cette cérémonie-là qui est organisée euh, par la Russie demain pour euh, souligner l'annexion de territoires occupés en Ukraine. Quelle est votre réaction? Est-ce que ça peut changer la posture du Canada? Est-ce que ça pourrait entraîner des actions supplémentaires de la part du gouvernement canadien? J'aimerais vous entendre là-dessus. Uh, merci beaucoup pour la question. Nous condamnons fermement le soi-disant référendum de la Russie dans les régions occupées d'Ukraine. Ils sont complètement illégitimes et le Canada ne le reconnaîtra pas jamais. Pas maintenant. Pas jamais euh, et jamais. Nous appelons les autres pays 
à se joindre à nous pour rejeter les tentatives de la Russie de voler le territoire ukrainien par la violence et la terreur. Et je voudrais dire aussi que ça, c'est injustifiable. Ça, c'est contre l'ordre international fondé sur les règles. Ça, c'est illégal. Et ça, c'est pas acceptable. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Alors voilà, c'est ce qui met fin à cette euh, conférence de presse. Merci à tous. Merci aux interprètes qui étaient là aujourd'hui.